what, what we know of uh, basically about the Zulosoi, uh, which is very critical, is that in actuality, the uh, the Zulosoi really is is a an organism, and this is a very powerful concept, and so on. In other words, in the, in the physical universe, and in the in the various different planes of existence, we have a certain knowledge of each other. But the question really is, what is the natural knowledge that we have of each other? What is there to know about each other in an organism? So it's a very important thing to understand that in order to create the possibility of free will, where a person has the ability to change his mind about who he is. It affects the fundamental knowledge uh, of his own organism, where he has a different concept of who he is and from what he is. Why, why, why is that? Why does the British interfere with the person's knowledge of himself? Because intrinsically, Every zulosoi is connected, every zulosoi is connected to every other zulosoi. There's no such thing as a separation, really. There's no such thing as a true separation between every manifestation of the zulosoi. Like we said, that's because there's no real concept of separation. It doesn't exist. And this is very important to understand. When we think of God, what is the most important idea that comes to us from God? What is the one idea that Judaism says or the Torah says about God? So what that idea is the following. In old, there is no other. In other words, what the Torah is telling us that the essence of God itself is that he's one being without another. But not that he's uh, someone who, where another God does not exist. But that another God is not possible to exist. So when the Torah stresses the concept, it stresses the unity of God. It's achtos. And what it says about his achdus is not simply there's only one God, but it says fundamentally that there can be only one God. In other words, God has no, no outside. And this is a very powerful idea. This is the only thing that really the Torah says about God. You know, that God is a certain power that we have never seen before. You know, when people think that someone is very great or very big or very powerful, they think of God in this way. But God is not described as the most powerful thing or the most knowledgeable, about this, knowledgeable thing or the most pleasant thing of all. God is not giving an adjective as to say that he has certain qualities which are infinite or all-powerful, all-knowing. That's not the main thing, the main uh, uh, factor when the Torah describes God. When the Torah describes God, it's that there's nobody else. That is his power, that there is nothing else besides him. In other words, God is, 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 is simply um, a being who has no outside. So there's no other possible being. And why is that? Why doesn't God have an outside? Because the existence of God is his exclusively. In other words, there's no, there's the most important concept that the Torah tells us about God is that his existence is never shared. It's not shared with anything else. 
and that it's a personal property of him. His existence, the fact that he is, is personal to God because it's unlike anything else and gives no existence. It does not allow that existence to be shared. So his existence, the existence of God, is a, if I may say it, is a personal matter. And that since God is the only person as such, it seems the only individual that exists. So therefore, his existence is, ex is actually totally personal to him. It's not a general thing that can be shared with anyone else. So therefore, nothing else does exist. Why? Because nothing can exist. Because existence is not a process which is attached to the essence of a thing. Existence is synonymous with the thing itself. You exist because existence belongs to you. So in a certain way, the existence of God is completely personal and cannot be shared with anything. So therefore, nothing else can exist. So the, the Torah stresses that the, what the power of God is, that the power of God is simply in the word exclusivity. Existence is exclusive to God because it is a personal property that belongs to God. And nothing else shares it. So from that unity that the Torah described to be God, everything proceeds from. So therefore, since God is the only thing which can exist, Anything which is derived from him must be a single thing without compartments, without parts. Just like he has no compartments. We say that God, is the, the word that we use to describe God is the word poshut. He's simple. What does that mean, simple? It simply means that he has no parts. He's not composed of different elements all strung together to make one being. So when you think of God, you cannot think of different aspects of him. You know, you cannot think of his power. You cannot think of his, uh, of his existence. You cannot, cannot exist of, of his presence. Because none of these things are qualities which are outside of him. Every quality that he possesses is absolutely personal. And that's what his yichud means. His unity refers to the fact that everything in God is completely personal to him alone. And nothing exists outside of him. So therefore, not even the quality exists. So in other words, God does not have a, uh, a component because composed of different elements. Because if he was composed of elements, each of these elements would be a separate thing. And there's nothing separate about any aspect of his being. So therefore, anything which comes from God comes from that force. It comes from that unity of what he possesses. And that's what the word poshut means. Simple. No, it's no, he's not composed of any idea. He's not composed of a quality that has any sense of independence. So poshtus is identical to his unity. That God's unity is so incredible that there's nothing in him which is even separate from anything else. It is the same thing. Every quality that God possesses is Him. It's not a quality of Him. It's not a certain factor that He has. It isn't. It's Him. He is everything that He is. Nothing is outside of Him. Nothing else exists as a concept 
or is an existence outside of him. So all of it is jumbled together and equals the same thing. Every one of his qualities is equal to himself. So God therefore is Pashat. So what does this tell me that's so important? The unity of God tells me that everything which comes from him, whether it's derived from him or whether it's created by him, has an absolute unity also. Just like he is completely unified with himself, he is himself. Anything which comes from him and was created or not has that unity and the fact that it comes from him. So this tells us something about the Zulusa, which we find very strange. God does not make one specific Zulusa so that he made two, three, four, five Zulusa. God did not make the Zulusa into something which is quantifiable. And the Zulusa that comes from God, that is derived from God, it's an absolute also unity. That's why we say that the Zulusa is an organism. The Zulusa is not a being which is divided into different types or different parts, all jumbled together. The Zulusa is not a quality or an attribute. It cannot even be counted in a sense but it also doesn't have a part to it. And this is very difficult to understand, that there are no parts to the Zulasa also. In other words, the Zulasa itself is pure consciousness. And in a certain sense, the Zulasa is a single consciousness. And this is very hard to understand. So when the Zulasa sees another Zulasa, in a certain sense, from a certain point, they're looking at each other because they are each other, not exactly like God. There's nothing outside of God. So therefore, everything that he is, is him. In a certain similar way, the same thing applies to the Zolosoy. The Zolosoy really represents, in a certain sense, a being where every part of that being is part of the totality of that being. We cannot have a true understanding of that concept. We cannot truly understand the unity of the Zulusoy. Like you have different parts of the Zulusoy, but all of these parts are fundamentally equal to the whole. And we cannot truly comprehend how something which has parts, different aspects to it, and so on, is has a, such a total unity. And that's a certain concept which is known in Olam Haba. We cannot understand the way a Zulasai, one Zulasai, looks at another Zulasai in Olam Haba. Because it's much more than simply seeing one thing sees another thing. In a certain way, when one Zulosa is looking at another Zulosa, in a certain way, they're almost like they're looking at themselves. That's right. The unity between Zulosa in Oil Mabo is almost like looking at yourself, like a mirror image. It's like you're looking at yourself in a mirror, which fundamentally looks a lot like you. But yet on a certain level, it's not you. So the question is, how does, this, uh, how does this take place? How does this unified vision of a Zulosoy exist so that when the Zulosoy looks at another Zulosoy, it's almost as if he's looking at himself. It was make up your mind. Either you have a multiplicity of Zulosoy's or you only have one Zulosoy. But how could there be a multiplicity of Zulosoy's that are fundamentally one Zulosoy? What's the nature of such a being? 
And that's what I'm going to try and talk about now, this concept, the concept of multiplicity. Because in all the mazer, in this physical world, when we're looking at something, we're looking at a separate identity for each zulasai. I see a zulasai as separate from each other. So that's how I see the concept of the multiplicity. That each zulasai is different than the other zulasai. But in Olam Haba, something happens where all the individual zulasais that I see, I, when I see the total multiplicity, I'm really looking at a unity. A unity which also almost does a unity which actually replaces the multiplicity. So I'm going to try and give you a better concept of this, but it will be a little difficult. What exactly do I mean by the achdus or the unity of the zolosoi in its totality? Is the zolosoi really just an organism? And how close are the parts of the organism? You know, what is the true nature of the relationship of one zulasoi to another? And this is why I will try and explore this in a certain way. You see, you have to remember, what's the fundamental problem uh, that God wants to heal? What is the problem that antagonizes the yichud of the Vodashonim? Or the thing which antagonizes his yichud is the concept of multiplicity. God does not fit at all with the concept of multiple or multiplicity. And this is the main idea what the Torah says about God. Enoid, there's nothing else. And there's nothing else, there's no other being included with God. The only being is God himself. And there's no possibility of another being at all. Surely there's nothing outside. And anything which competes with that, any attempt to try and exist in some way as independent of God, or rather as outside of God, cannot succeed. Because his unity is such that it creates a certain pressure. It must be God's unity is fixed. And that unity is so fixed that it cannot be altered. In other words, in a certain way, there's one thing that God cannot do in a certain sense. But the fact that he can't do this is not a limitation on him. He can't do that because of his, his, his being is so great. God cannot create another God. Because what's the definition of a God? It's a being which is completely independent of everything, even its own existence. God has an existence which completely belongs to himself. It's not given to him by anyone else. We say that's the concept of a subject. He has his own existence. Why? Because he is his own existence. That's it. That's what he is. He is existence itself. He's a subject. God has self-awareness. But that self-awareness is so identical with his essence that his self-awareness is existence itself. Nothing can share it. And that existence produces a pressure so that there's nothing that can exist besides God at all. And therefore, that, that yichud, that level of yichud, produces a certain pressure which counteracts even the possibility that something else exists. So God cannot create a being that says to him, you, me, you. 
Because that indicates multiplicity. God cannot create the concept of multiplicity. He is an absolute exception to that concept. God cannot create something which can refer to him as you. Where you are outside of me. That possibility does not and cannot exist. And that's his yichud pressure. The only thing that possibly comes near that is the zulosa itself. And this problem, where the zulosa begins to approach on a certain level, what's that? What? And this possibility is really what is referred to as Nam Sufa. That the Zulosai is a being who is also a subject. And he has self self awareness and he knows that he exists by himself. So therefore he almost fits the description of another God. But he's not another God. He's a he's a derived from the God himself. But since he is almost like another god, and that's what it means, when David Amelech said that the Zulosa, mankind, is slightly less than God, it means of all things that God created, the only being that's capable of saying you on any level is a person. That's right. And that's the godless of the Zulosa. That to a certain extent, but not actually, to a certain extent, he can actually say you to God. And that's why God says to him, you have to fix that. It was my being will not tolerate someone saying you to me, will not tolerate a being who's outside of me. And that has to be fixed. And how do you fix that with mitzvahs? Because mitzvahs fundamentally make you one with me. It creates the concept of love. And the reason why you love me is because you're really part of me. And when you really love something, you see that as part of you or as you are part of it. And that's the only thing that heals that yichud pressure. And that's what creates the possibility that mankind has to do mitzvahs. He has to acknowledge that push comes to shove, that in the final analysis, you cannot say to God, you. You cannot refer to him as if you are outside of him because you are still totally inside of him. And if you want to maintain any kind of feeling that you are outside of him and you say to him, me, you, or you, you call him, you therefore are committing the greatest uh, evil of all because evil is nothing more than the attribution that God is a you. That's another way that I'm going to define evil. What is evil? What is Ra? Where does it come from? Well, God never made it. It doesn't come from anywhere. It comes from a completely uh, uh, a view that God can have an outside. And it comes from the view that possibly you are outside of God. That is pure evil. And that's the, a direct contradiction to the nature of God. There, God is not a you to anyone because there's nothing outside of him. So God never created e e uh, evil as such. Evil is completely a rebellion against the concept of his unity. And therefore evil cannot exist because it is a total contradiction to God. So therefore the fundamental purpose of a being, of a zulosai, is to get rid of that evil. How? By completely acknowledging the fact that God is not a you to him. The word you does not apply to God ever in any sense. There has to be a complete uh, a recognition of this fact. And this fact and this fact alone creates the concept of yichud pressure. And that's the real reason why you have to mistake in it. You know, it's no one really discusses that or realizes its intensity. 
what it simply says in a way as a as a possibility is that the pre- the reason why a person has to do mitzvahs is that he earns a certain recognition from God that he exists. And then he establishes his own existence by something he does. He then removes the disempowerment which he feels. And when he removes a certain disempowerment, he's capable of going to Olam Habo where this disempowerment doesn't exist anymore. But that indicates simply that the Zulosoi has to do something where he creates the possibility in a certain way that God is a you. Because he's doing something for God. So in a certain way, he has to do mitzvahs, he has to earn the possibility where God is a you to him. But this is not true at all. Nothing can be a you to him. He cannot be a you to anybody, no matter what a person does. This disempowerment will exist forever, beyond time. It's impossible. God has to remove, the, the, the Zulosa, he has to remove even that thought that such a possibility exists. Because it doesn't. So that's why Nam Sufa is a problem, is a, is a pathological problem in a certain sense. It's a falsity. It's a disease that completely contradicts the true nature of God. And therefore it has to be removed. And it can only be removed when you love him. And that's only removed by doing something completely because he requested it. So it's a completely recognition that there's nothing outside of him. There's nothing that can contradict him. So in a certain way, Nam Sufa is like a medicinal problem. It's a problem in health. If you are a Zulosa and you exist because God made you, and you refer to God as a you, well, that's, patho- that's pathological. That's a disease that has to be removed. So the very creation of the Zulosai as a being who almost has the possibility of referring to God as a you has to be healed. It has to be cured. And that's what the whole avoid of the Torah is. God says to the Zulosai, you have to heal yourself from this disease that you think you're outside of me. And if you don't, that disease will finally end you it will make it possible, impossible for you to exist. So since the Zulosa is so closely connected to God and so closely connected to God's unity, what about the Zulosa itself? What about one Zulosa in its relationship to another Zulosa? Obviously, its own relation to another Zulosa must be so intense it must be so close that there actually even barely exists the possibility that the Zulosai can say you to another Zulosai. The problem is somewhat similar to God. Just like a Zulosai cannot say you to God, a Zulosai is very difficult for a Zulosai to look at another Zulosai and say you to it. Although it can do it a little more, the Zulosai does not produce a yichud pressure. It doesn't have that level of yichud. You cannot say to, to the Zulosoi, Einoid. You cannot say it. But to some extent that's true. Therefore the Zulosoi also has a problem of Nam Sufa. Because the Zulosoi has a certain divinity to it. And that divinity is, is, is captured by the idea of Einoid. So the Zulosai has a problem with saying you to another Zulosai. It doesn't have the same problem as that saying you to God, but to some extent it is. That's why the creation of the Zulosai is a being with also a relative unity. Just as God is completely one in an absolute way where he has no outside, the Zulosai also is relatively also one without an outside. 
So technically speaking, there's no such thing as two Zulosos. That the Zulosoy exists with such a close unity with another Zulosoy that for us it's incomprehensible. But the question is, how does this work? So God had to do something which is extremely difficult. God had to apply a certain pressure between Zulosoys, where one Zulosoy looks at another Zulosoy and sees someone who's completely outside of it. And he refers to this other Zulosoy as a you. Me, I am a Zulosoy, and you, you are a Zulosoy. And both of us are outside of each other. You see, that of course is a false view because the two Zulosoys are not really even outside of each other. Although it's very difficult for us to comprehend that. What does that mean? One Zulosoy looks at another Zulosoy and doesn't see him as outside? How is that possible? Either there's a multiplicity of Zulosoy or there's not. Well, that's the concept of an organism. The Zulosoy, all Zulosoy together, really together, constitutes one organism. And therefore, every Zulosoy knows intimately every other Zulosoy. How does he know him? Well, that's what we have talked about. How does one Zulosoy know another Zulosoy if he's actually almost one with every Zulosoy there is? How does that work? But God needs to do that. In order for God to heal the Zulosoy and make him realize that he is not outside of the Zulosoy, or rather the Zulosoy is really part of him, he has to also heal that from himself as he sees another Zulosoy. In a certain sense, just like the Zulosoy cannot see God as a you, in a certain sense, that's similar also to one Zulosoy to another. That each one does not truly see the other one and outside of him. I know this is a shocking concept because here on earth we all see each other as separate. But this had to be created. This concept had to be developed. It does not occur by itself. The independence of one to from one to the other is not a true fact. It's an only apparent fact. It looks like that's true. Here on earth when I'm looking at another person I'm seeing someone as a you. is outside of me. But the fact that we both come from God, we are both derived from God, both of us as Zulusas are derived from God, tells us, tells me really, that in a certain way, not to the extent with God, but in a certain way, two Zulusas merge. So the concept of Pashtus applies to God in an absolute way. God is completely one being. He's not composed of any parts. There's no multiplicity in God. But in a certain sense, that also applies to the Zulosoy. So therefore, in Olam Haba, when we see another Zulosoy, I'm almost looking at myself. That's what that really is. So this concept when I am, when I look at another Zulosoy, that I'm not really looking at someone outside of me, but I'm looking at someone who's almost inside of me. That's called a superorganism. An organism is a, a kind of an entity which is composed of separate parts, all having the same function. The human body is an organism. It's composed of organs that do the same thing. The purpose of the organism, known as the human body, is to keep the person alive. So it has different organs for that. There's the organ of what? The brain, there's the heart, there's the liver, stomach, and so on. So even though these organs are separate from each other, but in relationship to their task, in relation to what they do, they all do the same thing and they exist for the same purpose, to keep the person in life. That's why it's called an organism. That's why that organism knows every part of it. Every part of that organism is known by every other part of the organism. Why? Because they share the same idea of life. 
They all contribute to the same idea. So therefore, there's no such thing as a stranger in an organism. Every organ in the human body knows every other organ in the body, and therefore it refuses to take a transplant of an organ from another body. It rejects it because it says, I want my organism. I want my liver. I want my stomach. I want my heart. You, I don't want you to give me another heart because the identity of an organ is unique to itself. But in Olam Haba, this is much more powerful. The identity of every Zulusay is specific to the whole Zulusay. There's a concept, there's a concept called the total Zulusay. That's the macro Zulusay, which is composed of all the Zulusays that were ever derived from God. Fundamentally, they all come together in one real super organistic being. There's something called a superorganism, and that superorganism is the macro zoolosoy. And every part of him really <clears throat> is part of the whole. So therefore, one zoolosoy looks at another, another zoolosoy and really and thinks it's looking at itself. Like one, one zoolosoy looks like it's every, almost every other zoolosoy. Do we lose Rav Shimon? I think so. <laughs> we can call back in, I guess. Want to stop the tape? Or... I'm trying. It seems like it seems to stop. Hey. Hello, hello. Yeah, we lost it. Hello. Okay, okay I'm back. Okay. Somehow the uh, <laughs> I got lost. All right. Okay. So what I'm saying that there are different levels of organism. That there must be an organism. The zoolosoy is an organism. It's part of one entity, part of one body. But the organism of the zoolosoy in Olam Haba is so unified that to almost a certain degree, every zoolosoy, when it looks at another zoolosoy, is almost looking at itself. That's how close. Does it look at another zoolosoy uh, completely like a, uh, itself? No, because there's a slight differentiation between every zoolosoy in that to to total organism. There's a slight difference. There's a slight level of an outside. But that level of one Zulosa being outside of another is so slight that it barely exists. So the concept of Olam Habo, the main feature of Olam Habo, is that two Zulosas almost look like each other. And therefore, all of them together Every component zulosoy looks like it's the same as a total zulosoy. We cannot comprehend this level of unity. But in order for God to give us the test of whether or not we are separate from Him, He has to make it possible that we see things as outside of us so that we can believe that we have an outside. And if we think that we have an outside, we think that God has an outside. And that's called the Yetzirah. The belief that God has an outside and can be referred to as a you is false. But that is the belief of the Yetzirah. That is the belief which is subject to the Yichud pressure. That unless you understand that God has no outside and is not a you, you cannot exist. And the Zolosai has this problem. It sees God as a you. 
So it has to learn to love God. But fundamentally, this is totally untrue. God is not a you to anyone at any time whatsoever. But what I'm talking about, the relationship of one Zulose to another, the only difference is somewhat slightly less. When God, when the Zulose sees, when he knows God, he sees God as an absolute, uh, as, as an absolute being which has no outside. But when he looks at another Zulose, he does see somewhat a concept of outside, but it is so slight that it's almost as if he's looking at himself. But God has to alter that to allow the Zulusoy to massacre his problem of Nam Sufa with each other. So therefore, God has to create a world in which Zulusoy see each other as totally separate. And there are different madregas of separation. And I want to describe the madrega of the separate uh, 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 site of uh, one Zulusi to another. Now I want to talk about the Zulusi himself. How does the Zulusi know about the existence of another Zulusi? How does he see another Zulusi? How does that organismic uh, relationship that he has with another Zulusi manifest in the different worlds? Now we understand that what God wants to do, what God wants to test the Zulusi in terms of how he sees him. God, he has to do it by manifesting them in such a way where he sees another Zulusai as outside. So in other words, the way the Zulusai learns of the absolute unity of God is when he observes other Zulusais and he notices a strange thing, that there's almost an absolute unity between him and another, and another Zulusai. That's how he learns that God himself has no outside. Because you cannot know God. You cannot observe him in any sense. You just know that he's outside of you. But the nature of that outside is impossible, impossible to comprehend. We cannot comprehend the yichud of the Rav But that lesson comes to us because we can, what we come to realize is that really we can't even comprehend, we can barely comprehend the outside aspect of the one Zulosoy from another. So how does God disturb, how, do these, how does God disrupt this knowing of the Zulosoy from each other? How does he make it sound like when the Zulosoy sees another Zulosoy, he's looking at something outside of himself? How does he do that? Since the real nature of the Zulosai is almost an, a complete unity, how does, God manage, how does God manage to create the concept of multiplicity? So the answer to that is in the, what's called the Ishtalchalis. That we go from one world to another. That is the essence. What is the essence of the Ishtalchalis? That what? that the Ein Sof has to create what the Rishimu, a trace of him. And then with the next world, he goes to another pl plane of existence called Odin Kadmoin. And then after that, he goes to another plane of existence called Asilis. So when we look at the Ishtalchalis or the chain of one reality to another, what's really changing? What's changing is how one Zulosoy sees another Zulosoy. And therefore, automatically, how the Zulosoy sees God? You see, that's how it's done. The Zulosoy learns of the unity of God, that God is not a you, by seeing the unity of another Zulosoy, that another Zulosoy is barely a you to himself. So, that's what he's, so therefore, when he sees another Zulosoy and he realizes the organismic relationship that he has with another Zulosoy, he begins to comprehend who God is. Because if another Zulosoy is barely a you, God is absolutely not a you. So he understands the yichud of his, what the one who created him, the, the one who derived him. He understands his yichud because he sees the yichud between himself and all the other Zulosoys. So therefore he appreciates the Achdus of the Banashom. So the, the nimshul of all the, of the Ishtalchulus of Elamas, 
In the Kabbalah, you have the first oilam, what you call, what's called the Mishimu, which is the highest level of Zulasai. And then the next level of the world called Odin Kadmoin, which produces the Zulasai as an object of Tikkun. And the next level is what? Is Atsilis, the world of Atsilis, which creates an interaction between Zulasais. And then finally, the Zulasai becomes an entity of the world of Bria, Yetzir, and Atsira. But the end result is that the Zulasa exists in the world called Asiya. And what is this world? This is the world where one Zulasa sees another Zulasa as completely outside of it. That's all that's changing. You have to understand that every world is part of the Ishtalchalis, which is part of all the, the planes of existence that God created, are simply become darker and darker, which means that multiplicity seems to exist. As we descend in the world, as we go from the world of Odom Kadmoin to the world of uh, Atsilis, we see a greater uh, uh, concept of multiplicity. And as we go from what? Well, we come from Atsilis to the world of Bria and, and so on. We see the idea, the concept of multiplicity becoming more and more stark. So by the time we get down to the world of Asiya, we are in a world where literally one Zulasai looks like it's completely outside of another Zulasai. The concept of organism does not exist anymore in the world of Asiya. <clears throat> you see, the concept of an organism on its super level, which is Oilem Habo, exists to such an extent that the Zulasai is a super organism. There's barely an outside. And on the lower worlds, this concept of billion outside is shrinking. So the other Zulasai appears to be withdrawing from him. And to create the idea of multiplicity. So one Zulasai looks at another Zulasai in the world of Odom Kadmoin as almost connected. And he looks at another Zulasai in the world of Atsilis as almost connected, but somewhat separate. And in the world of Bria, more separate. And the world of what you see, were more separate. And the world of Asiya, as totally separate. So what's being developed from one world to another is a greater and greater appearance of the concept of multiplicity. And what is multiplicity? Multiplicity is the creation of the appearance of an outside. That's it. As you go from one world to another, you are creating a greater and greater concept that there's something outside of me. So what's being developed in the Ishtalchalis from one world to another in all the worlds of Kabbalah is simply that the concept of an outside is being aggravated until finally it reaches its, its peak at the world of Asiya, where literally when you're looking at another Zulasai, when one Zulasai looks at another Zulasai, he thinks that he's looking at something outside of him. So the, the term you becomes more and more valid. In the higher worlds of Asilis, Adam Kadma in the higher worlds, there's barely a concept of you, barely, of an outside. And finally, when you get down to the world of Asiya, which is the lowest level, you have a specific idea that there is an outside. Why? Because there's a multiplicity. There's you and there's me. You and me represent a duality. And that duality appears to be real. And since it appears to be real, we see therefore what? That the world is composed of two things. It's composed of the concept of me and the concept of reality. There's something outside of me in a plane called reality. I exist in reality. And what does that mean? There's I, and that's my consciousness, my self-awareness, exists among other conscious beings, which is called my reality. So therefore, as we go from one world to another, and down lower and lower and lower, reality begins to take on a definition What's created from one world or another? The notion of reality. There's something outside of me. What is reality? That there is something outside of me. The essence of reality 
is the notion that there are at least two things in the world that exist. Me and outside. Me and reality. I exist in a reality. So I am part of the multiplicity of creation. There's me, my self-awareness, in something called reality, where there are things which, besides me, there are things which are outside of me. This is a very deep concept. So we see that God, when he creates the worlds, when he derives the worlds, it's called a shtalchilis. There's a, a slight noise. Could you make sure that, that your um, recording has no noise? Okay. So this is a very deep concept because now we finally understand what the Stauchelis is. When you go from one world to another world to another world and you are going down. And what does it mean you're going down to a lower world and a lower world? You're going down because what's being created is the concept of outside, the concept of reality. Why does God want to do this? Why does he want to, that, why does he want to take the appearance of the Zolosoy as a superorganism? Where was the Zolosoy is looking at another Zolosoy, he's actually in a certain way looking somewhat at himself. Why? Why does he want to disrupt this level of unity of the Zolosoy? Because he wants the Zolosoy to understand that when it comes to outside, God himself has no outside. At the highest level, when God exists, there is no such thing as an outside of you. And that's what God is. You cannot see God because you cannot contrast him to anything outside of him. There's nothing you can uh, contrast him with that indicates any type of duality. So God wants you to have this comprehension as a Zulasai by seeing your relationship with another Zulasai. That on a certain level, you also have the same relationship to another Zulasai. That there's barely an outside. Because just like God is an absolute unity, the Zulasai is said to be a relative unity. There's barely an outside. There's barely a separate being. The word outside means multiplicity. When you see yourself and you realize you have an outside, something is outside of you, you are seeing a duality. A duality is the minimum amount of outside. If you see something that's outside of you, that's through your reality. So God has to bring that condition called reality or called outside to teach you that he himself has no outside. And that's the whole purpose of the Ishtalchilis. So the whole purpose of all of God's creation is to introduce to you the concept that there's you and there's something outside of you. So that you will eventually realize, what? That there is nothing outside of God. He introduces the concept of outside the concept of duality, the concept of multiplicity, so that you should understand that when it comes to him, there is no such thing as outside. And you will suddenly grasp, to whatever degree, some kind of idea of who he is, of what his yichud is. That God is not related to you in the sense that there's something slightly outside. You're slightly outside of him. No. You are not outside of him at all. It's absolute. There's no exception to it. And the only way God can bring you that concept is by creating a reality where multiplicity is true, where there is at least a duality of me and you. <clears throat> so he has to create the possibility of that reality where there's me and you. Why? So that you can deny that reality. And that's what happens when you love God. When you love God the way he has to be loved, it's because you recognize that God is not outside of you. And you are not outside of God in a certain way. So God has to bring you down to the lowest level of perception of reality, that there's a multiplicity in reality, so that you will reject that idea. Right? 
he introduces the idea of multiplicity so that you eventually will reject that idea as being untrue. Why does he want you to reject that idea? Because that idea will annihilate you. His yichud pressure is such that if you have the idea that he's outside of you and therefore he's a you, you cannot coexist with him. That would be coexistence. And two subjects cannot coexist. So therefore he creates something, he produces something so that he can reject it, so that he can cause you to reject that possibility. So therefore what does he do? So he doesn't change his reality. God has no upside. But what he does is he changes your reality. And what's your reality? The way you look at another zulasai. As your view of a zulasai changes, so will your view of him, God, change. As you realize that you're closer and closer to becoming one, you will realize that he is already at the stage of being an absolute one without a second appearance, without someone else. There's no outside. So this is the fundamental irony. The fundamental irony of God's creation is to eliminate the possibility that you see him as a you. But in order to do that, he first has to create that possibility that you can see him as a you that you see things in multiples. And when he creates that possibility, then eventually, through your commandments, the avoda of the mitzvahs and loving God, you will then deny that possibility because God does not have an outside. He's, he, and that's his postures. So you learn from yourself who God is. That's your Rebbe. The only way you come to understand who God is, is by someone understanding who you are. But that God exists in a way which is far beyond you, because God has nothing outside of him. Whereas on a certain level, you still retain something outside of you. And that's another zulasoy. That's called a superorganism. So I'm going to prove this concept this ironic concept that God creates something to get rid of it. God creates the concept of outside so that you can get rid of the concept of outside, that you understand it does not apply to him. It only applies to you, and only subtly. And that's the unity, the achtos of the zolosoi. It's somewhat ironic, isn't it? And we see this truly, and I'll explain how we see it. When I see someone, let's say I see someone, I see another person. What am I looking at? In, other words, in the physical universe, what do I possess? I possess something called a sense. And a sense tells me that I can detect another person. But when, I, when I'm looking at another person and I see what? I see, first of all, that there's something outside of me. Because there's something separate from me. My vision creates the sight of another being outside of me. But does this sight give me knowledge of this person? Do I know who he is? When I see somebody walking down the street and it's another person, what do I know about him? Nothing. He's a total stranger to you. Why is he a total stranger? Because it's bizarre how you see him. And this is a very deep concept. How do you see him? What is sight? What exactly is a sense perception? The truth of it. It's the ability to develop what's called a mind photo. That's what it is. When you see someone, you're really looking at the light which bounces off this person and is reflected to you. That light enters your eye and it, and it, 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 it settles on your retina. And your retina takes the uh, take the sight and converts it into electrochemical impulses. No GPS, What's that? What is sight? In sight, you are taking the light which is reflected by another person, and that reflection of that light goes into your eyes, and your retina in your eye cells what a hundred trillion 
a hundred uh, million cells in your retina converts that light into an image. It takes each image that your eye sees is composed of a hundred million components all fit together, which gives you an image of that person. And where is that image put? It's put on your mind. It's put into your self-awareness. And what do you see? You see an image or like a photograph on your mind. Are you seeing that person? No. A sight is not about a person. When you see something, you are seeing nothing. What you are seeing is the image that your mind is cre- that your eyes are creating and placing on your mind. So therefore, every sight that you have, without exception, is like a photograph. It's a photograph. That's all you can know. The closest you can get to another person is simply that you are aware that something exists outside of you. But what is it? You'll never know. You cannot see what it is that you in your mind. You have an image in your mind, and that image looks like the person. It's called looking like. It's called a sight. But there's no such thing as a sight. A sight of another person is purely in your mind. You are never in touch with the reality of that other person. You don't even know what that reality looks like. It doesn't look like anything because sight is a photograph. When you see something, you are making a photograph of that thing in your mind. And that's simply a reflection of the light that's bouncing off him. And you are taking a photograph of that and you are placing that photograph in your mind itself. The photograph does not exist out of your mind. A vision that you have of someone does not exist outside of your brain, which means something shocking. It means you can never come in touch with reality itself. Reality itself can only be viewed in terms of photographs. When you see something, you are making what's called, and you call it sight, you are seeing something in your mind. When you hear something, you're hearing it in your mind. When you touch something, you're, 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 you're developing a feeling of what the thing feels like it's in your mind. When you touch an object that feels hard, there's no such thing as hard. Hardness is simply a feeling that your mind is giving you of what that object is. And same thing with smell and touch, with taste. So all five senses that we have allow us to detect another thing. It allows us to detect the existence of something else. What is that existence? We have no idea. All we have an idea of is that we have five senses which tells me five different photographs of what this thing looks like in our mind. That's it. So the whole purpose of a sense, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, a sense is nothing more than a photograph which is in my mind and which represents that thing which I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out what it is. So we see something very powerful, that the closest we can get to another reality, to that which we see as a multiplicity, the closest we can get to that is simply an image in our mind. We cannot get closer to it. So all that our mind then, is, it just tells us, it detects something. When you see another person, What's really happening is your mind is saying, I detect the presence of another person through senses. Sight, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting. All of these are photographs in my mind. And that's what uh, the detection is. So the closest we can come to anything else outside of us is simply to detect its presence. But do I know anything about it? Nothing. And that's called a stranger. What is a stranger? A stranger is simply the art of detection. I don't know it. I don't know what it is. I cannot know it. I cannot know something outside of my senses. And all my senses tell me is that this thing appears as a detection. I detect the presence of something which is in my mind. I cannot get closer to it. And that's why it's called a stranger. A stranger is something you can detect, but you cannot know. You have no knowledge of that. When you see another person, you say to yourself, I don't know the person. I don't know who he is. 
I don't know about them. I don't know anything about them. No, you're not saying that at all. What you're really saying is all I can do is detect the presence of something else. I have no knowledge of that something else except the photographs that my mind is showing me about this other thing outside of me. So in the Olam Asiyah, which is the lowest world, our knowledge never, uh, never uh, uh, succeeds in knowing something. It only succeeds in detecting the presence of something. That's the whole Olam Asiyah. And that's the concept of a stranger. The concept of a stranger is what? Is when I know that something exists outside of me. I detect its presence. But I do not know anything about it. I do not know how it exists outside of me. All I know is what I see in my mind that tells me the photograph of what that is. That's the maximum amount of knowledge that I can, I can accept in my mind in the Oyla Masiya. Now in the higher world, when I'm spiritual, when people pass away and they become souls, they can see another soul. That's right, they can. But it's not called sight, but it's called a deeper knowledge. Because in the Oilam As uh, in the in the Oilam of Ruchnius, which is the world of Yetzirah and Bria and so on, you can actually more than detect another presence. You can actually know something about the other presence. And what do you know? You know something about what that is, what the tachlis of that is, what that being, that soul, has to masakin. So suddenly you get new information. How do you get this information? Well, you don't get this information through your senses because there's no senses. In the world of Ruchnius, there's no such thing as seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching. No. There's another sense. It's called the ability of one neshama to know another neshama. But the seeing is not an act of seeing. It's not a sense. It's not a sensory act. It's a knowing act. When you, let's say, when, you, when one neshama looks at another neshama, it knows who that other neshama is. In other words, what used to be a sight when that soul was in a body now becomes an act of knowing. In the physical universe, which is the oil of it's an act of detection. The closest we can get to another being is we detect the presence of something else, but we have no knowledge of it. That's called a stranger. But when one soul is looking at another soul, it knows who that soul is and what it's about what it has to do. So it knows that soul in terms of its act of taken. Where does that knowledge come to it? It comes to it automatically because the connection between one spiritual entity and another is one of connection. Suddenly, its ability to know another soul, it knows that other soul through a knowledge of itself. The knowledge of another soul it's contained within the knowledge of yourself. So therefore, it's a much deeper level of the detection. It's no longer simply detection where you know that something is outside of you. You actually know what that thing is outside of you, and you know what's outside of you is a thing which has to, which has to what? Which has a certain job, taken. It has a certain tachlis, a certain purpose that it has to fix itself in a way, and you understand exactly what that process is. So when a soul sees another soul, it sees knowledge. What is simply a sense on this world, and some, that's the knowledge at the level of this world, of the physical universe, in the spiritual world, that knowledge becomes an understanding of who that other soul is. Not simply that that soul exists you know, there's more than the knowledge of detection. It has an actual knowledge of knowing who is that other soul. So we see in the world of the spiritual world of Ruchnius, we are suddenly now in touch with the organismic aspect of our relationship. We are not in contact with the organismic aspect of our relationship in the physical world. 
on the physical world, it looks like that being is completely outside of me. But all I'm doing is detecting it. I don't go any further than a detection. I have no knowledge of the person other than the fact that there exists something outside of me which is producing through my five senses an image in my mind. That's it. All I can do is detect the presence of another thing. But I do not have any knowledge that we, him and I, are, are, are organismic, that we are part of the same being. But in the world of Ruchnius, I suddenly have that knowledge. That knowledge is, this, this is, 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 is similar to the self, to the perception uh, in, the, in the spirit universe. So what is knowledge about the other being is actually the way to sense the other being in the spiritual world. The sensing of another person is not done to a sensory organ. Like how, how does one see something? Well, that's through the sensory organ called the eyes. The eyes allow my mind to create an image of that person. So I detect them through my senses. But in the spiritual world, I don't have eyes. What do I have? I have a certain in, internalized knowledge of that other being automatically because I sense the organismic relationship between us two. So what is knowledge in the spiritual world is only a sense detection in the physical world. And this is very deep. So what I'm saying is I'm defining what is knowledge of another person. Just because you detect them, well, that's not knowledge. Good, you detect another presence. You detect the concept of an outside, but you don't know anything about the outside, and therefore it's called a stranger. But in the spiritual world, you know who that outside is. You know what he's about, what he has to do. How? Well, it's not done to what? It's done because in the spiritual world, you are capable of detecting something which is part of your organism. So that's how you know another organism. You know another Zulosa in the spiritual world because he's another organism. And you know him because you know you. Finally, when you go to a higher world, to the world of what you see and breathe and so on, your knowledge of that person becomes greater and greater. How? It simply is. You simply know what you know. Why? Because you know yourself. And as you know yourself, you are also gaining information about the other person, about the Zulosai. So one Zulosai therefore begins to see pieces of another Zulosai, which are much deeper. On the lowest level of physicality, all you can do is detect the existence of something, of a multiplicity. But you cannot know anything about it. But in the spiritual world, you can, you can not only detect, but you can actually know that other being, yeah, that other Zulosa. How? Because you know yourself. And on a higher world, you know more about the person and more and more. So finally, when we come all the way up to the highest world again, when we are in Olam Habo, we not only know, we not only know that there is something outside of us, we not only know what that thing is in terms of its tachlis, what its, uh, its domain is. We not only know what it has to do, what it has to be masakin. We intimately know how through our connection, it's the connection between one cell to another cell in an organism that tells me this information. Just like an organ, the heart knows the brain. Each of the cells know each other. How? How do they sense it? They sense it by the other sense in themselves. The unity of two zolosos. And this is critical. Knowledge comes by seeing our, our unity as an organism. And when I begin to see the fact that we have a relationship called an organism, I begin to have knowledge of what that zoloso, that other zoloso is. Finally, in Oil Mahabar, I have the highest knowledge of another Zulasai. That's right. Because in Oil Mahabar, I not only know that something is there, I detect it. I not only know who, who is that person, what does he have to do, what is his tactless 
in terms of the tikkun of the total organism. I not only know that, but I know one more thing that I do not know in the lower worlds. I know what my relationship is to that other Zulasoi. That's right. Not only do I know that he exists, not only do I know that he is part of an organism in a certain sense, and I know what he has to do, but at the highest level, I know his relationship to me. So in other words, the yichud that we both possess, the fact that he's not really outside of me, is known in the highest level of existence, which is Olam Haba. That's when I have a knowledge, not only that another Zulus exists, not only, which is no longer a stranger, I know what he has to do, I know the features, the qualities of his being. But at the highest level, I know how those qualities of his being relate to me. How him and I relate to each other in the total organism called the Zulasoi. I have a sense of who that guy is and who I am in the Zulasoi, the macro Zulasoi, the total Zulasoi. And that knowledge becomes so serious that it's almost like I'm looking at myself. Why is it like I'm looking at myself? Because at the highest level of knowledge of another person, which is an Olam Haba, I'm like, it's like I'm looking at myself. Why? Because I'm looking at myself through him. And I'm looking at him through me. In other words, I'm looking at both of us through what we share in common, which is the ultimate Zulasai. So we see, therefore, the way that knowledge is grasped. It goes and the Olam Asir, which is the lowest level, where there is the most highest level of separation, all I can do is merely detect the presence of another being, of another Zulasai. I can only detect that there is something outside of me, but I have no idea really what that is really. I just have a bunch of photographs in my mind of it. So that's the lowest level, and therefore I am furthest, furthest away from seeing myself as an organism. But then when I become spiritual and I'm a soul, I can sense what this other person is. I have knowledge of not only detecting his presence, but knowing who he is. And that means I know something about his tikkun, what he has to do. And at the highest levels of spirituality, which is the Mahabha, I not only know who, that he, I not only detect his presence, and I not only know that he is, but I know his relationship to me, which means that I, what I am now detecting is not the individual aspect of our zulasoys, but I am detecting the, what's called the macro zulasoy, the total zulasoy, and all its parts. I see myself as part of the total zulasoy, and I see him as part. Please, there's, there's, there's a noise. There's a noise coming from someone on the phone. Because in Olam Abba, I not only see myself, I not only have a knowledge of the other person, but I also have a knowledge of both of us in terms of the totality of who we are. And that's called the macro zulasoi. I see not only the foreground, where I see him and me, but I see us. I have, a, I have the knowledge of us, of we. And what is the knowledge of we? The knowledge of we, or us, is a knowledge of the plurality of all Zulasoys as they fit together in terms of a macro Zulasoy, the total Zulasoy. The total Zulasoy is composed of all the individual Zulasoys as a superorganism, as almost being like each other. And I have that knowledge finally. So we see that the way I know another person changes with whichever plane of existence I am. Just like when God made the Ishtalchalis, when he made one world lower than the next world, lower than the next world, as he went down through the worlds, it became darker and darker. What became darker? The knowledge that I am part of an organism. That's what gets darker and darker. So the further down I go, the greater the knowledge of myself and so, or I should say, the, the greater the, the possibility of seeing a multiplicity, that we're all separate. So that if I be at the physical level, I see someone else as so separate from me, he's a stranger. But as I go back up, 
as I go back up in the spiritual and finally to the level of eternally, Nitzchias, he said, I suddenly have a knowledge of what? One, that I can detect his presence. Two, that I know who he is. I know who the other Zulus is and what his tachlis is in what? In the organism. And finally, I see him in the tachlis of a superorganism. I can see him and me as part of one super being called the Zulusai. And when I have that level of comprehension, which is astounding, then I begin to have the knowledge of who I am, who I belong to, who am I a part of. And I see the totality of the existence of the Zulusai as an entity. And suddenly I comprehend God. Because I say to myself, what? Is this my relationship with everyone else? In other words, I'm not separate from everyone else. I'm part of everyone else. And finally, I get to such a knowledge where when I'm looking at another person, it's almost like I'm looking at me because I understand the relationship that that other Zuloso has with me. So that's when I begin to realize God. God is, an, is a being who is completely beyond knowledge. There is absolutely no outside to God. As if it's impossible for us to even know it. We do not have a, a frame of reference to look at God. But that's when I realized that frame of reference is completely the absence of an outside. And I suddenly begin to understand who God is. So what I'm describing in this year is that the progressive forms of how I know things. How do I know something in the physical world? How do I know something in the spiritual world? And finally, how do I know something in the eternal world beyond time and space? Now, one more thing. When Adam sinned, he developed a new world that didn't exist before. And what was that world called? That was called the world of Zorma. Now, most people don't know what Zorma is. The word Zorma means impurity, contamination. So when Adam did a sin, the first man, Adam Rishon, before the sin, the world was clean. It was not composed of any, in, 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 any uh, concept of impurity. There was no tumor. All you did was the absence of the, uh, a concept of, of a unity of an organism. When you go from the highest world to the lowest world, what you're losing is the concept of the unity of the world. You're losing the concept of unity, of organismic unity. That's what you lose. But that's not in self impure. That's not contamination. But when you do a sin, suddenly a contamination comes on your ability to know something. It's now contaminated. How? And I'll tell you exactly how. Because when you live in the world of Zorma, which is the world of, compl- of, uh, of great host of darkness. What did you do? What did you do when you suddenly did a sin? You unplugged from God, and God took what you should have been annihilated because you defied God and unplugged from him, so you should have been annihilated because he takes away his existence. Instead, he lets, he lets you live, but he lets you live in a state of darkness. But what is that darkness? What is the difference between the darkness in which we see people in the physical universe? What is that difference? And we see everyone as a stranger. And what is that darkness in the world of Zorma? Could Zorma be higher than seeing another person as a stranger? The greatest darkness is when we see another Zulusai and we see him as a total stranger. So all we can do is detect his presence. We cannot know anything about him. In order to know something about him, we have to go up to a higher plane of spirituality. So then suddenly I begin to see the shadow of an organism. And in all of my body, I see the complete unity of the organism. Okay. But what happens if I go down? What happens when I do a sin and I'm in the greatest form of darkness? What is the greatest form of darkness? How does it manifest itself? It manifests itself. Oh, why? How? Because you're, when you look at another Zulusoy, you're not looking at a stranger. You are looking at it as an enemy, as an adversary. That's right. In the world of Zorma, 
every other Zulasa becomes an adversary, becomes an enemy. That is the darkness of Zula, of, of Zoyama. The darkness of Geshem, the darkness of physicality, is what? That you do not see the unity between you and another one. You do not see any sense of an organism. That's the darkness of physicality in the physical world. But if you sin and you defy God, suddenly perception is not a stranger. You're not looking at a stranger. You are now looking at an enemy, as an adversary. When you're in competition with someone who's against you, who wants to destroy you in the competitive act. So the world of Zoroth produces a new concept that I never had before. Before when I was just simply a physical person, but I never sinned, I have the concept of another person as what? I have the concept of another person as a stranger. That's it. And when I go higher, I have the concept that he's an organism. And then finally a superorganism. But what's the concept that I have of another person in the world of Zorma? What does Zorma introduce in its impurity, it's in, the, in its contamination, that is a new level of darkness? And that is when I look at another person, I see a competitor. I see an enemy. I see an adversary. And what's called an anti-organism. An organism is something, is an entity where each of the separate components work together as a team towards the same goal. That's an organism. And I cannot see the concept of organism in the physical universe. Every, everything appears as outside of me, as a stranger. But what happens when I sin and I therefore I introduce a new level of darkness where suddenly I see this other person not as simply someone outside of me and so on, and who I merely detect, but I see this person as a danger to me, as a threat. I see him as an enemy. So then suddenly what appears is the world of predators. What is a predator? A predator is someone who does not look at someone as an outside being, but he sees that person in terms of his own needs. And the main need of a predator is to eat, to eat. So therefore, one animal eats another animal. Now that's a hellish activity. Why does one animal have to eat another animal? Why do we have to eat plants? What's going on here? Why do we have to absorb another entity, plants, animals, and so on, inside of ourselves to exist? In other words, why do we see any, why do we see every, every other entity as our food supply? That's what happens. In the world of Zorma, we see every other being outside of us as part of our food supply. And what kind of punishment is that? Before I saw him, as a, when a lion looks at a what? When he looks at a zebra before the sin, he didn't see his food supply. He wasn't a, a predator. He wasn't a carnivore. He didn't eat other animals. In other words, in Kaldemachet, before the sin, there was no such thing as predation. Nothing ate another being. They coexisted. But after the sin of Adam, there was created the concept of a predator, where another being became the food supply of the other being. So this is the worst type of relationship you can have with something outside of you, where it's your enemy. Or actually, it's your food supply. You have to eat it for you to survive. And that's the concept of predation. Why? Because Zorma is the ultimate predator. Zorma has to feed on your soul by virtue of the sin that you did. When you do a sin, you bring a certain contamination into your soul. And then the, uh, the Zorma eats from that kedusha that you have in your soul. When you do a sin, you give the entitlement of another type of spiritual entity to actually use you as food and that in the Kabbalah is called Yonika to be Yonik is to nourish from is to nurse, to feed on something else and the concept of feeding on something else is the concept of a predator of predation and therefore that is an activity which takes place only with entities which are created in the world of Zorma so therefore we see in the world of Zorma, which was created after the sin, was a new type of relationship between each other.
when we do not see simply each other as an organism. We don't even see each other as strangers. Because you can be strangers and still be peaceful with each other. But we see each other as enemies to use each other as we wish, to use each other for the purpose of continuing to exist. That's the relationship which exists in the world of Zohar, predation. So look at what I'm saying. In order for God to tell us about himself that I cannot be known because I have no outside, he had to create worlds which begin to distance us from ourselves, from the Zolosoi. The Zolosoi is suddenly broken up from a superorganism to a position when he can't even, all he knows is to detect the presence of something, but he doesn't know who it is. So you go from what? A superorganism down to an organism, down to the concept of no organism, where you're strangers. All that exists in the world to produce the idea of an outside so that you would mistakenly think that God is outside of you and God wants you to correct that and annihilate that concept that you're not outside of God. So that's why he called what's called the Ishtalchilis, one world to another where each world, each world that descends is now has a darker place because you used to see each other as a superorganism. And then you went to a darker place and now you see yourself as a, just an organism and a darker place where you see each other as strangers. So your relation with each other is now being uh, changed. But if you commit a sin, so suddenly the entire picture changes when now another, another being, another Zorosoi, is not simply what? A non-organism. It's not simply a stranger. It's an anti-organism. It's your enemy. It's your adversary. It competes with you. It threatens you with the concept of predation. That's where a predator comes from. That's why when Yeshaya says, and the lion shall, and the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, that in the time when it comes the time in the Yemoisa Mashiach, when the Mashiach comes and brings the Gula, predation will disappear. There will be no longer any predators in the world. Why? Because no animal will feel like the other animal is its food supply. That concept will no longer exist. So we see how far we are away from God. That not only do we see God as a you outside of us, but we begin to see each other as a you. First a you as an organism, then you as a non-organism, where someone else is a stranger. Then finally in the world of Zoma, after I sin. You see another you as what as an enemy of yours, which has to be destroyed through predation. So we notice that our ability to relate is continuously becoming less and less. It's continuously decreasing. So that under the rule of Zorma, under the world of Zorma, under the contamination and purity of Zorma, we are now enemies. And that's what it's about. So now you understand the most important principle of all. God teaches us that he is not a you. It's not a me-you relationship. Because that would instigate his yichud pressure to annihilate you. But you have to learn that the hard way. So God does that by creating different realities which continuously covers up your real relationship of a superorganism. And finally you get a relationship, what? Where you're a stranger. And that's where you start from. But when you sin, you go even further down. You're not even only, not only do you not have the relationship of an organism, so you have a non-organismic uh, relationship. In the physical universe, we all feel to each other as strangers, unless we're, with, we're relatives or friends. But we don't have any concept that I'm part of an organism with you. We have no such concept. You are a stranger, which means that you now exist in a non-organismic relationship. That's right. But when we sin, we go down one step further than the physical. We are beyond the physical because now I see another person not simply as what? As a non-organism or he's a stranger. I see him as an enemy that has to be destroyed. And that's what a sin does. It changes the view that I have of the Zolosa itself, the Zolosa, the knowledge of the Zolosa changed from a non-organismic stranger 
to an enemy. That's the wages of sin. That's the consequences of a sin. And when the Mashiach comes, he will remove that lowest level called Zohama. He will remove death and the concept of never again, of, of never again seeing non-organism relations, relationships. When the world becomes spiritual again, to and so on, we will redevelop the insight that all of us are related to each other. We are connected. We will all have knowledge of each other as part of the macro zurasai. And finally, in Olam Haba, which is the ultimate place where we become one again, we become so close to each other that it seems to be that when we look at another zurasai, we're almost looking at ourselves. That's how close we will become. We will be called a superorganism where every person will almost equal every other person because that's who God is. But God is not an organism at all. God is beyond an organism because God has nothing to do with an outside. So I'm trying to paint a picture that we will eventually come to the knowledge of who God is by obtaining the knowledge of who we are that we are not separate entities completely divorced from each other. No. We are an organism. And in Oilam Habo, we will become a superorganism. And that's knowledge. When you have no knowledge of someone else, that person is called a stranger. When you have knowledge of someone else, that person is called an organism. And when you have the total knowledge of someone else, where you not only know who you are and who he is, but who you are together in the organism, you are a superorganism. So we have descended from the highest level of being to the lowest level of being, where we always see each other as strangers and even enemies. And when the Mashiach comes, who will remove the insight of Zorma, we will finally begin to see who we really are to each other. And we will not hate each other. We will love each other. They will develop a love between one Zulasai and the other Zulasai. That's why the Torah says, that you should love your neighbors yourself. Why? Because he is almost yourself. He is Kamocha. Why do you have to love another person? Because he is almost you. The word Kamocha tells me the reason why love is possible between two people. Because you are almost one person. So this is the entire uh, mechanism, dynamic of all the physical and the spirit universe and Oil Mahaba, the eternal universe. There are three universes. The eternal universe that has no time and space. The spiritual universe that is known to souls and souls are, like I say, are certain lenses which gives me a knowledge that my relationship to someone else is an organism and finally, when it appears that there is no organism, that's the physical universe. But also, even when there's Zorma, there's an anti-organismic universe. So this is what it is. And we go down to reality, and finally we go back up to reality. And it all proceeds to teach us one concept. And what's that concept? What is the ultimate lesson that I have to learn by me going through all of these worlds, one after the other, down to the lowest level of perception of who another Zulasai, to the highest level of perception where I see another Zulasai as a superorganism? What? It's the knowledge of who God is. God says, I am not like you. I am not an organism with anything. I am absolutely alone individuated, independent. I am beyond the concept of outside. There is nothing outside of me. And the way you will learn that is when you learn your own relationship with each other. You will learn who you are, and then you will know who I am. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Just based on the last statement you made, that that is why God did it, so that we would learn from our relationship with each other who God is. But Code of Hachet, right. we didn't have that issue. There was only one Zulasa. The Zulasa, there weren't multiplicity of Zulasa. And wasn't that, so it, this was only like a, uh, a, a, a Bidiyavid position, you know, 
but lecharchila, that's what's not well, supposed to happen. I, actually, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Oh, well, can you still repeat that? Yeah, that you, you just you just summed it all up and said that you, you know we that Hashem created this frame of reference from one zulaso to another in order that we should yes. then be able to learn who got it. okay. That was the, the theme of the of today's uh, shir. Right. But kodem kodem achay. When Adam Arishon was just, there was just one Zulaso. There was no multiplicity of Zulasos for one type of yeah. reactions to each other. So that concept didn't exist. No, but it's, because Kodim is the hate of the Zulaso. Adam Arishon was only one person. Every soul right. was connected to each other inside. But the Namlik Sufa that existed then, the problem was between him and God. Not yes, between him and another that. person, right? No, but I'm so not God said, and all that was, was created. Wasn't that created even then? The Shalshos existed. Kodama no, no, you no, no. In, in other motion before the sin, there was no issue of him to himself and him to other people because there was no other people. There was only him right. and his wife. So Nam the exactly. Sufa did not exist between man and man. Because the individuation of mankind, right. each person from another, Agreed. only appeared after the sin. Agreed. Before the sin, I, humans are correct. sensitive to each other. Got it. But the, you got, I, I got thought it? you were bring Yes, no, I understand that. What I'm saying is that the idea of, that God created the man-to-man situation so that we would understand the man-to-God situation better. But my point yeah. is that the man-to-man situation did not exist before right. the sin. And therefore, right. that, that wasn't Hashem's original plan. But in a way, in other words, the Nam the Sufa, the problem of multiplicity, did exist between man and God. That's how it started. But in a way, by the hate of other religion, he was commanded to do something by God. So the conflict lay with God. And that's what he was supposed to fix. That's true. It was not with other men. But after the sin, it, uh, it, 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 it descended to all other people and so on. But the, the, now the Suva appears in stages. It first appears originally with God. That's the main issue. But then, if you don't correct that, it then suddenly reappears as a new issue between man and man. So what I'm right. saying, you see, I, 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 I agree with you. I'll, I'll modify that slightly. But it's not that, the, it's still a problem in the outside. The one problem that God has with the Zulosoi is that the Zulosoi keeps on seeing the concept of outside. God is a you. Yes, yes. And it Correct. first starts with God. And then later on, it descends to mankind. So that's true. So uh, in that my sense. point was so what the man to man idea was it? Well, well, what I well, what, what it meant was uh, I, I meant really after the sin becomes a, an extended version of Namatsuva. It's altered mm-hmm. slightly. Well, I, I I didn't I, I did not mention to be more exact that initially it started out man to God. So so that's. So what I'm saying is, is that you are correct in that way. Initially, it was man to God, and then it became man to man. But it's essentially the same problem. And that's yeah. why, I, I, maybe that's what I mentioned, because the problem is what? The problem is the concept of outside, period. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes, agreed. Uh, any, yes, any other questions? Okay, very good. I you hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to say, I just was, well, so, first of all, I want to say, I'm fat, I was fascinated by the concept of food. With, uh, What's that? You know, moving from the concept of food and how you can trace the history of the eating patterns of, like, after the flood, we can eat animals, and after the sin, animals ate each other. And, right. And it was, right. So, now, so here's a question for you. And in Olam Haba, there is no eating, which is great. So... And in the desert, we ate the mun. All this amazing thing, you could make a whole share about that. But I was wondering, what, in Gan Eden, Adam was supposed to eat fruit. So how does that fit in there? Was he a, pred- a predator on the fruit? Well, no, no. Look, 
souls don't eat it all. There's no feeding of a soul. They absorb the light from the from God. They don't eat in a sense. So in actuality, the Zulosa exists in a state where no eating takes place. There's absorption of the light of God. So in that sense. But in the physical universe, the concept of eating was created. And the eating of a plant seems to be, it does not qualify as predation. That's what you see. Because ah. you're allowed to eat plants. Predation starts between animal and animal, not between animal and plant. So I'm going to modify that. You know, the, the predation exists between man and uh, an and animal or animal and animal. Why? Between, because it, it seems to take its, the outside, it's, it's an exaggeration of the concept of outside. At first, an outside is another uh, form of an entity. But then the worst concept of all is when the outside becomes your food supply. That's predation. It was never meant that the outside should become your food supply. All you have to do is distinguish between you and an outside. That was the task of other mission before the sin. He had to realize that God was his outside, and he had to stop calling God a you. He had to understand that God himself does not have an outside. But after a while, when he sinned, he created the concept of outside, not only as there's an outside, but there, there, there exists the concept of predation, where the outside is now become a certain way your adversary, and it sees you as food supply. But it's just an increase in the concept of outside. It's The word outside is changing from a neutral force to a to to a, 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 an, a, an adversarial relationship. So when you sin, so, you are changing the nature of the outside. So why, why the outside is that special? Well, uh, that has to be that 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 I I have to uh, think about. But the plant has okay. a kind of a life cycle where it does not uh, respond to the concept of predation. You wouldn't call a uh, plant. Well, there is a certain thing of plants. Some plants, plants eat other plants. So you you have the concept of predation with plants too. You know, uh, for example, like the Venus fly tra fly trap. I think that plant sure. eats uh, insects. So this wasn't meant to be. And I, I doubt if the Venus f f fly trap or even ate bugs. I, I, in other words. The concept of predation is a concept which derives from Zorma. It's not a natural thing for one thing to eat another thing and so on, to cause it to die and then to eat it. That is completely unnatural. And that's only the result of a sin. That's when the concept of outside has completely descended to its slowest form. So in other sense, yeah. uh, we see that as true. But that has to be examined more. But the general concept is what I said. There's a, first of all, there's a concept yeah. where so, something is an organism. And then there's finally a concept where something is a non-organism, strangers. But then finally when Zorm appears, there's a concept that there's not only a concept of non-organism, but an anti-organism, where the thing is your enemy. So we see the continuous de-evolution of the concept of outside. Okay, uh, okay. So, Shimon, so then we, Shimon well, yes. I, um, the, I guess the fruits in Ghanaian were not a predatory act. I guess that was part of the, his actual organism. Is that what you think? Yeah. Koidemachet, all them eight plants. For some reason, that's not. Con when you eat a plant, even though a plant has a form of life, it's not considered predation. It's only considered right, right. predation when you eat another animal. Now, I can, today, exactly why I'm not, uh, I, I don't know if I can tell you that exactly now, but somehow the toad is not considered a predation. It's a very interesting concept. No, I understand. That's something to make sure I, I, I heard you clearly. You're saying that it was a denigration in, in the self, which, this concept of predatory yes. eating. Yes, but the, one, of the main, one of the main ideas that I wanted to say is this concept of what is God trying to do? 
He's trying to tell you, I'm not an outside. You're not outside of me. And the way he tells you that is by creating the condition of outside, where suddenly you begin to do what he says, the commandments, and then you begin to love them. So therefore you rectify that concept of an outside. You cannot eliminate it. When we see God, we see him always as a you. That's built in, you know what I mean? To something which is uh, as a source of consciousness that comes from him. But God says, but you have to eliminate this belief that I'm outside and that I have an outside. So first I will put you in a situation where that's what you see. And gradually by keeping the commandment and loving me, it will disappear. That was the original intention of the whole Ishtalchilis. It was, I'm trying to give you the nimshul of what the Ishtalchilis is. That when we go from one world to another, we are descending in our appreciation of what is outside. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And we have to negate it and rise up. So the purpose of descent, that the world descended to a higher degree of multiplicity and therefore of an outside has to disappear by our gradually our rejection of that concept. So we have to go down in order to go up. And the highest level that we reach relative to this is the Olam Habo, the future world, where we will all feel to each other in a way like we're almost part of each other. And that will, uh, that will uh, stay the concept of Yichud pressure so that we will continue to exist without time or space or any activity. We have earned our ability to exist by preventing the uh, one uh, possibility which will annihilate us.